So good morning, everybody, on this beautiful Melbourne morning. Uh, I would like to welcome you to this ESF webinar on navigating the new psychosocial regulations. Uh, my name's Susan McKenzie. I'm the CEO at the Emergency Services Foundation. And today I'm really pleased that we have Catherine Dunlop with us. Uh, Catherine is a partner at Maddox. She was the Deputy Chair of the Emergency Services Foundation for a number of years. And she is also a Senior Fellow in Occupational Health and Safety at the University of Melbourne. So we are in excellent hands with Catherine. Um, and I was thinking about it this morning, Catherine, actually in the shower, thinking about how things have changed so much. And, you know, when I first started working with Catherine about 25 years ago, it was really a psychosocial um, hazard in terms of a, an event that, that, that affected me so badly. And I don't think Catherine and I would have even given this a second thought at the mm -hmm. time. So in, the environment has really changed. And we're very grateful to have Catherine with us today because one month from today, Catherine is going to have a baby. And she's very, because she was supposed to finish um, last week and she's very kindly stayed on to do um, this and a couple of other things um, for us and other clients. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land. I'm down on the Mornington Peninsula with the Boon Wurrung, um, Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders uh, past, present, emerging and anyone here today. And obviously um, all of the places where you are as well. How we're gonna run this today is Catherine will keep her eye on the chat and she will answer any questions in the chat that you might have. Um, so I'm just gonna hand over to Catherine now. Welcome and thanks so much, Catherine. Thanks, Susan. Um, and you're right. I think when we when we started working on these issues, uh, we were involved. Both of us were involved in a very traumatic um, incident and a subsequent inquest, and the matter went for a number of years. And, and I mean, I remember you know, we would occasionally sit down over a, a fine, well, even an average glass of vino, to be honest, and have a chat. But it wasn't in the context of um, what could be done about the fact that we were working in these very, very stressful conditions. So the world's changed, which is a good thing. Um, apologies in advance if I sound a little bit breathless during this call as well. It's not uh, it's not anything other than having a little less lung capacity at this stage of being pregnant. So apologies if, uh, if I do sound like that. I'd also like to pay my respects to um, the traditional owners of the land of which I'm meeting today. I'm coming you to you from the Wurundjeri lands of the Kulin Nation in sunny Docklands and pay respect to elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attending today. Also um, to acknowledge that we are here talking today about uh, mental health in part um, and that can raise some issues from pe for people, um, particularly if we, if I seem to be skipping over concepts quite quickly, it's not to fail to recognise the seriousness of it and also to acknowledge that there will be people on this call who might be suffering from a range of mental health conditions or physical health conditions. Um, the reason we're having this conversation really today is about trying to prevent those things. So uh, if any of this is triggering or anything, I'd, I'd certainly encourage you to get help. It's not the intention and I won't be telling any terrible war story today. What I do want to talk about um, is in essence um, three things. I want to talk about the proposed psychosocial hazard legislation. So there were draft regulations re prepared and um, released in Victoria at the start of last year. We're told that those regulations are still on the minister's desk. Um, <clears throat> I can make some guesses as to what they might look like when they're introduced, but I'll take you through the model that was there. I then want to take you through what I think is that overlap between the work of your PNC people, your risk people, your safety people, and what that means in terms of best practice implementation because whether or not we get the regulations in the form that they were drafted last year or we get a different version similar to that interstate, we get guidance on what best practice looks like in this space. And I think it's useful to think about these regulations less as an imposition, although many organisations see it that way, but also to think about the opportunity arising out of it uh, and then some practical guidance. And uh, as Susan said, very happy to take uh, any questions throughout, but particularly in the chat, and then we'll open up for some question time at the end as well. So to start with, I thought I would go through some definitions for you about what we're talking about today, because there's often a bit of confusion, and apologies for, for those of you who are very familiar with this, and this is all um, 
uh, something that you know well, <clears throat> but I think it's useful to talk about it in the context of a few of the concepts we're talking about today. So psychosocial hazards are hazards that arise um, from the way work is done. So from the design or management of work, the environment, plant, interactions and behaviours that may cause psychological and or physical harm. And that's because these psychosocial hazards cause a stress response. And if that stress response is prolonged, um, severe or frequent, it then can have an effect. Um, <clears throat> now, not everything that um, causes a stress response will lead to a psychosocial hazard. And in fact, I've got there on the right hand side, the definition of mental health from the World Health Organization, which I always think is the best in this space, which talks about mental health being a state of well-being, where you can realize your own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively or fruit and fruitfully, and you're able to make a contribution to the community, which really is most people in the emergency services sector doing the latter, clearly. Um, the difference, I think, between um, being able to deal with those normal stresses of life and it becoming a hazard are the extent to which those hazards interact, um, or they are disproportionate. Um, and so the issue, I think, for organisations and employers is what can be done to monitor those hazards and at the point at which they become uncontrollable or represent a risk. And one of the things that you'll see that is missing from the regulations and from the discussion is a discussion about vulnerability or resilience. But we have to acknowledge that some people will be less able to cope with the stresses than others, even in the, exactly the same working scenario with the same management and leadership style. That is no different from any other health and safety risk. Right? So the fact that some people may be vulnerable, um, may have been harmed by other work stresses, um, is really irrelevant in this case. We take our people as we find them. Um, I want to distinguish as well from psychosocial hazards and from psychological safety. So psychological safety is a term popularised by Amy Edmondson. Um, it's a very useful term. It talks about the absence or harm or threat to mental well-being that you might experience be, um, and in the context particularly about the belief that you can speak up on issues without being punished. So it's the ability to talk about issues. Um, there's a lot of nerdy debate, particularly if you go on LinkedIn on this topic, about whether psychosocial safety is related to psychosocial hazards. My view is that certainly the ability to speak up about issues can only make for a better workplace in the sense that people will talk and remembering that consultation is one of the key pillars under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. But it is conceivable that you will have um, an environment that has high levels of psychosocial generally across the organisation but there will be individuals suffering from very significant psychosocial hazards. And that might be because of the environment in which they work or because there's, it's just not possible with the leaders they have to have a speak up culture or because of the stigma associated with um, the mental health issues that they're dealing with. So I do think there's an interrelationship and I do think from my point of view, and, and you may differ on this, but that psychological safety I think is a pillar, but I don't think it's the answer to dealing with psychosocial hazards. Um, I can speak up as much as I want in certain workplaces, but it won't change the fact that I might be overworked dealing with bullies and dealing with traumatic work and exposed to occupational violence. The real question is what's being done to prevent that? And that's really, I think, in keeping with what I would describe as an evolution about the way we see mental health. So dealing with the situation perhaps uh, 20 years ago or a bit more when Susan and I were working together on the matter she alluded to, on the left-hand side there, um, for many organisations back then, they thought they were doing well if they dealt with issues well when they occurred. So somebody put their hand up and said, I'm suffering, an organisation looked after them, that was to be applauded, that was best practice. But at that time, the approach was very leader dependent. <clears throat> and some leaders were much more fluent and able to talk about these issues, and some were not at all. And, and you'd all be familiar with that in workplaces. I think over time we got to that position in the middle, which was recognising that psychological health issues were present in the workplace and doing some work on stigma reduction and training across organisations, um, the very important growth of EAP support, but in some way EAP support is necessarily reactive. And I think there's still an element at which organisations rely on EAP providers and that's the solution. So there's a problem we outsource it to EAP. And I was dealing with something this morning 
um, <clears throat> for an organisation that wanted to do some guidance on mental health first aid for its leaders to provide guidance on what to do when amongst that peer group they thought someone was suffering. And the PNC response was, well, there's a EAP program for leaders. And yet the feedback from the leaders is they don't want to speak to EAP. They wanted a peer or a colleague to assist them. So EAP has an important role and I don't want to diminish it, um, but I don't think it's the complete answer. And then for many years, we had what, what we cynically in my part of the profession call the fruit bowls and meditation classes, the resilience classes, all that work to say, you know, you might be working in a terrible environment, but here's an apple and try and meditate for 15 minutes a day. It'll make it better. I'm being a bit cynical there, but clearly that's not an answer for terrible working conditions. What we've moved to, though, I think is seeing a range of things differently. So some of the things that I think best practice organisations are doing, um, and, and the first one there is absolutely something that um, was always the case, but particularly through the Respect at Work report, viewing bad behaviour, things like sexual harassment and bullying through a safety lens. So it's not about person A being a terrible person because they behave badly, it's about understanding that as a health and safety risk, what are the factors that contributed to it. Um, having a mental health policy, even if it does not much more than say, here's our approach to mental health, here's the World Health Organization definition, here's what we do, and bringing together all of the things the organization does in relation to mental health into a policy or procedure or guidance material to really reflect that. And I've worked with a number of organizations who have pulled that together and then been able to use it as an opportunity to identify those pockets of best practice across the organization and say these are the things that are working really well. Um, <clears throat> reporting on mental health, so measuring it and reporting it, and not simply in a negative sense, here are the claims, but here's what our engagement survey tells us. Here's the people who are turning up to these events where we're doing the education sessions. Here's what we're reporting. Those things can necessarily be more qualitative than quantitative, but I do think they are important because they give you a measure for senior leaders to say, this is what we think about the mental health of the organisation. And if you think about the number of organisations that did that in an informal sense during COVID, got feedback to say, you know, people are doing a bit better this month or people are doing really badly right now, that informal feedback was still very, very useful and shaped the messaging. Uh, mental health first aid training, again, a bit controversial as to whether that is purely a reactive thing. Um, again, as someone who's done it and just got re-accredited myself, I find it useful because it gives you some fluency in language. Again, it's not a complete answer, but can be very useful. Uh, mature organisations are very conscious of that causative link between performance, conduct and mental health. So if someone's not performing, is there actually a mental health reason for it or should we, so we won't just treat it as a performance issue? And then the last two, which I think are the most important and what I'm going to spend most of the time talking about today, which is taking a risk-based approach. What are the risks to mental health in the organisation? So what are the things that make it more likely that you will have the hazards that we now talk about as psychosocial hazards? And um, are we actually doing risk assessments, updating them, putting in our risk register and, and thinking about it from a risk and governance point of view, uh, not just a that's the safety team role or that's a PNC role or that's about reducing the number of EAP calls or making EAP more available. And that really fits with, I think, the approach that's been taken to the psychosocial regulations. So a little bit of uh, history. There had been a review of the model work health and safety legislation across Australia, um, the Boland Review. Um, one of the recommendations from that was that there needed to be more guidance for employers in relation to mental health. So there was clearly a duty um, under all health and safety acts within Australia in relation to mental health and the obligation to reduce harm by eliminating or reducing it, not simply responding to it, <clears throat> but that many employers weren't clear on what that meant. So there was a subgroup of COAG, the workplace um, ministers, who got together and made a decision in 2020 that there would be regulations introduced across Australia. Um, there have been draft regulations under the model legislation, so every other state and territory is welcome to adopt that or welcome to adopt a variation of it. Um, and, and most states are well advanced in that or have, have adopted that or have put in and or have put in codes of practice. In Victoria, we had draft regulations, as I said, released early last year. Uh, those went further than the models in the other states and territories. 
So ours were a little more onerous in relation to what they required and particularly in relation to the hierarchical control. Um, so um, those regulations were, were released. There were a number of submissions. Uh, many were supportive, but many were also raising issues about cost. So to be clear, the implementation cost from the regulatory impact statement for organisations of 200 plus employees in the first year of operation, the estimated implementation cost was over 700,000. And then uh, the implementation cost for subsequent years was still many hundreds of thousands. I think parts of that might have been overestimated a tad, but if we go back to 2022 when people and culture teams were starting to start bargaining again, dealing with long-standing issues that had sat because of COVID uh, and the idea that, that you would find an extra $700,000 in your budget for this for the upcoming financial year was something that I think horrified many employers. So there was a lot of concern about cost. And the reason why the cost submission was in, dealt with in such detail is that the regulatory impact statement made the case to say, if employers spend this cost, it will reduce work cover claims. So there's a net benefit to the state uh, in that there will be less, um, less harm to workers. So they said the evidence was there that if you introduce these measures in the regulations, there will be less work cover claims. Wait and see what the regulations look like when we get them and what the, um, what the result will be. But perhaps to talk a little bit about these regulations specifically. So what are they actually requiring employers to do in the form that they were proposed? Uh, so this is a diagram taken from the Queensland Code, but I think it's quite useful. As I said, it, it describes these hazards there on the left that come from things like design or management of work, environment, workplace interactions and behaviours. So those are the hazards. They cause a stress response and then when they're frequent, prolonged or severe or any of those or when you get a combination of them, you can see there the psychological harm result and the physical harm that may result from it as well. And so the most interesting thing part I think of this is thinking about what are those hazards and every jurisdiction has a slightly different list in their codes and their guidance material which is one of the wonderful things about being in a federation, right? We can't quite agree. Um, but there's quite a bit of consistency around the world. So these idea of psychosocial hazards come in large part for some work done in Canada. They have had a standard for many years. It's been adopted in the US, the UK as well, and there's been a bit of work from the Surgeon General in the US about this. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a pretty good idea on what these hazards are. And um, here's a list of a whole bunch of them. Um, the one I've put at the, the start is the one that I think is going to be the most challenging for many organisations and uh, I wonder if it's going to be the new bullying and that it will be the phrase that's used by employees who are on the defensive because of performance or conduct issues. And I, I say that acknowledging that it's still a hazard but remembering that I am an employment and health and safety lawyer so we do see those things that are sometimes used as a, a shield um, to describe behaviour. But this is the idea of high job demands being a hazard. And as I go through these, all of you will be thinking that's me. So <laughs> high job demands, an intense or sustained high mental, physical or emotional effort required to do the job, um, unreasonable or excessive time pressures or role overload, high individual reputational legal career, safety or financial risk if mistakes occur, it's very common for the emergency services, High vigilance required limited margin of error and inadequate systems to prevent individual error. And for those of you who've been at the mental health and focus session, I've made this point more than once, so I'll, I'll make it briefly and then move on. But I think you can have an environment of high job demands where you have a fantastic leader, a great team, it's not forever, and you can put that effort in and it can be the most rewarding part of your career. But if it's going on forever and or you have a poor team, an unreasonable load compared to others and or a really poor manager who fails to inspire you, it can be the worst time of your career. So that goes to the idea of how do we then address high job demands. Some roles necessarily have elements of high job demands. If you're the, if you're a chief officer or an emergency um, management commissioner, you're going to have high job demands, but what can we do to try and reduce that harm? Fatigue in itself um, can both be a consequence but also can be an aspect of um, 
of a hazard. Um, bullying clearly uh, is a psychosocial hazard, as is sexual harassment. Uh, exposure to traumatic events or content and or vicarious trauma. Poor leadership practices and poor workplace culture. And as I'm going, you might be thinking about how these interact. Poor support, poor organisational justice. So not that goes in part to psycho psychological safety, but that sense that nothing will be done. Exposure to occupational violence and threats. Uh, <clears throat> alcohol and drug use, again, can be a symptom, but there's evidence about the fact that um, some organisations have that as a coping mechanism. It's a cultural thing of going out for the drink um, or, unfortunately, in the construction industry, there's evidence suggesting that that kind of drug use is um, it can become habitual, so that in itself can create a hazard. Uh, poor physical health because people don't have time to exercise or to do the things they need to do to look after themselves. In contrast to high job demands, low job demands, not having enough to do, not being um, stimulated by the work you do. Low job control, which again can combine with high work demands. I can't pick when I work. I can't pick what I, how I organise my working day or my working week. Um, I'm constantly at the beck and call of others. Uh, low role clarity, so I don't understand my role. I'm being criticised for not doing various things. Remote or isolated work. Now, this was a hazard identified many years ago and is, in fact, the subject of a specific regulation in all Australian jurisdictions about the risk that people who work remotely or in an isolated way need effective communication styles, which I find really interesting in light of the, the big working from home experiment and the people who perhaps are less engaged with work because they're working from home. And look, don't get me wrong, I'm a big supporter of flexible work and working from home, but it does change the dynamic and you do have a risk that people will feel isolated from their colleagues and will suffer from what's called proximity bias, where the people who are, amongst others, get the opportunities and the collaboration and the camaraderie and the people who are working remotely don't. Um, poor organisational change management and low recognition and reward. And the point about all of these as I talk through them and the approach and best practice in relation to them is that they are all in them, their own way different hazards. So they will arise in different ways for different parts of the organisation um, and it's not a one size fits all. So I was listening to someone last week, someone I, I respect a lot, but his, his view on this was um, it's sufficient to kind of consult by talking to a few people in the organisation getting a sense of it. But I'm not sure that's quite right because ultimately um, there may be pockets where you have some of these hazards and not others and they will change over time. And so understanding what hazards exist in your organisation is a really important part of this because it's about understanding cohort risks and work type risks. The other point about this is clearly that you can have accumulation and interaction. Um, so, for example, there's evidence that says uh, if you are exposed to trauma or suffering vicarious trauma, the chances that it will be harmful to you are much worse if you are also fatigued. Or, as I've said, if you have high job demands and poor leadership practices in the organisation, the risk of harm increases as well, and we could do a whole range of those things. So, where we are across Australia generally is that there are regulations that exist or will exist for the rest of Australia that really make it incumbent upon employers to identify the hazards and do something about them. And sometimes that's in the regulations or will be in, in all states and territories, I think, say what's happening in Victoria. And sometimes it's also supported by a code of practice. Um, so I don't expect you to memorise any of this, but just for your reference, um, there we have already um, regulations at the Commonwealth, New South Wales, Queensland, Tasmania and Western Australia. Um, many of those are supported by a code, which is the kind of detail on how does this work. Um, <clears throat> most of them have the same um, issue. So in most of those jurisdictions, it's simply set as an obligation by what's called the PCBU, the person conducting the business or undertaking, which is the phrase used in those jurisdictions to describe the duty holder, they must manage the risk. Um, the thing that, that differs um, across them is what's in the code uh, and the extent to which they then deal with a hierarchy of control, which I'll come to. Um, 
<clears throat> and in Victoria, as I said, we don't have them yet, but we do have a whole lot of material um, that already supports in, in WorkSafe through WorkWell and others that replicate some of the material in the regulations anyway. And remember that the regulations put the flesh on the bones of what is a duty. So you already have a duty under Section 21 or 23 of the OHS Act to eliminate and reduce risks to harm to employees and volunteers and others. Um, so if you are not thinking about psychosocial hazards, I think it can be opportune to think about it even without the regulations. And many of you will be doing any of those things. You will already have systems in place to deal with bullying and sexual harassment. Um, you might have systems for identifying fatigue management. The question will be, is there more that you can do? And does, does um, the material in these regulations change your thinking about what best practice might be? So I'm going to take you through the way the regulations deal with this issue. I'm not suggesting you need to implement them ahead of them actually becoming law, to be very clear. But I do think it's an opportunity to think about what are we doing in this space and can we perhaps pick up some elements of it and look to refine them? So is this an opportunity to say, is there a better way to do what we're already doing? And so the regulations, in essence, have a series of um, obligations. The first is that employers have to understand the risk. So they have to understand what those hazards are in their organisation. And you already have some data on that from things like engagement surveys and claims. Um, but you can get more, for example, by consulting. Um, understanding that the regulations and the way they were drafted only apply to employees and contractors. So they do not apply to your volunteers. But clearly, if you're in Vic SES or CFA or St John or elsewhere, you already owe a duty under the Act in relation to those people. So why would you not take the bits from the psychosocial regulations from work well and think about, well, how does that apply to our volunteers and what does, what does good and best practice look like? The point about consultation is that you will, uh, you already have an obligation to consult under the Act. In many cases, that's done through designated work groups and health and safety reps. But I think in this space is an opportunity to go broader. So I worked with an organisation who was doing a big piece of work on sexual harassment and they picked cohort groups to go and talk about the risk of sexual harassment and uh, a hostile, sexually hostile workplace. And they picked the LGBTQIA workers. They picked people who were in their first year within the organisation who were of a certain young age group. They picked people from a, a, a couple of cultural groups who worked in isolation. They picked from people who were working from home. They picked a group of people who had to travel with managers one-on-one -on -one in a car. They were junior to their managers. Their managers were more senior. Uh, and they picked a few others and they, they consulted in very small cohort groups. And they had said to me beforehand, not sure how useful this is going to be, but to be honest, part of it is just messaging. Like at least if we if we consult, we show we're, we're taking it seriously, we might learn something. And they were blown away by the feedback they got because when they got those cohort groups together <laughs> without management, without others talking about these issues, their understanding of risk changed quite a lot because they got a lot of information and feedback that they would not otherwise have had. So consultation in this space, I think, is really rich. The obligations then require that you have to, having consulted, understanding your, your hazard profile, you have to implement control procedures. And that's done in accordance with the hierarchy of control. So I'll come to that in a second because I think that is the most important part of the draft Victorian regulations. And then lastly, there are obligations to, to review that from time to time whenever a complaint is made or new information comes up. Um, so this is not a one-off process that we do once, it's one that we continue to do. The other obligation that was in the regulations was to provide de-identified reports on a six-monthly basis um, to deal with a series of risks and also to develop some prevention plans. So I'll take you through those. But I do want to talk about the hierarchy because I think if you remember nothing else from this session, I think this is the key thing to understand about the way thinking on psychosocial risks has evolved. So you remember that, that, that chart at the start of how we've moved from just dealing with people who are unwell well to taking a risk-based approach? That's reflected in this. So many of you will know 
the hierarchy of control that exists for physical risks. So we eliminate wherever possible the lowest control is PPE. Um, and if we think about, uh, in a physical sense, we think about COVID, it's the, the perfect example because PPE, people couldn't quite work out where their nose was when they had to wear it. It's much less effective than isolating people, which is one of the higher order controls. So there's a little bit of debate about um, whether this hierarchy is it's settled for psychosocial risks. And one of the reasons it wasn't included in most of the other states and territories was because the view was it's a bit new and it might not quite be right. But the way the Victorian regulations are drafted in effect says you have to, you can't rely on these lower level controls unless you've tried the higher ones. And for the prevention plans, you will have had to have documented it. Right? All WorkSafe can come and audit and say you might need to go back and redo this. So at the, the top here, the idea is that if we can eliminate a risk, we will. Now that might be hard, it might be hard to eliminate high work demands, it might be hard to eliminate um, the risk of occupational violence, but clearly that's the highest order control. The next level is to look at job design or work design and systems of work. So this is about saying, what do we ask people to do? And at an organisational and team and holistic level, have we got the mix right? So it's about things like resourcing, looking at hours of work, looking at your reward and recognition structures, structured change management, giving rotation of, of tasks, having job clarity, um, having job crafting and job control. And if anyone is interested, um, there's some really great material that the Commonwealth Government put out on job crafting, the ability to say, these are the bits of the work I like the most, because there's a lot of research to say, that job crafting, the ability to play to your strengths and also understand what uh, inspires people about working for a particular organisation uh, is a protective factor for some of the other hazards. Um, and if you if you can't find it or you want, email me and I'll send you some material. I think in the, um, in the sessions for the Mental Health in Focus, I talked about this in the context of work that was done in the US on hospital cleaners. And so hospital cleaners typically had a terribly, pretty awful kind of workers' compensation history, a constant bunch of hospitals. But when they researched that, they found that there were some hospitals which had much better rates of um, in relation to worker injury and much greater engagement by their hospital cleaners. And the common factor there was that their hospital cleaners felt acknowledged, so they would be thanked by surgeons, and they described themselves as ambassadors for the hospital. And when they were asked about their role, they would say things like, I clean hospitals and so I save lives, <laughs> not I'm just a hospital cleaner. And likewise, the idea that if you have a group of people in a team, not everyone can play to their strengths, but if there's a sense of meaning and you get to pick the parts that you like, so which is any part of a good performance improvement, sorry, a good um, uh, uh, annual performance process, that that also helps. Culture, clearly very important as part of the system of work, and likewise the workplace environment more generally. So we have to work on fixing those things to avoid psychosocial hazards before we can go to the next level. You may have, certainly you should be doing some of these lower order controls as well, but we don't start with them. So the next level down, things like policies, training, skill development. So what that tells us is if we've got bullying issues in our organisation, revising our bullying policy and running out some training is not going to be as effective as looking at the factors under job design and systems of work. And I suspect we will get to a world um, in some form in the future when we get some form of regulations where if you do have a bullying issue and work safe are coming out to discuss it, and I think they will take a constructive compliance approach for a number of years, they won't be terribly impressed by simply having a policy and doing some training. They want to know what you've done about some of those other issues. And then lastly, at the lowest level, we have what we might call support. So things like EAP, a trauma-informed approach, good workplace investigations, things like protective alarms for occupational violence. Again, all have a role, but less effective in dealing with the hazard than those preventative sections there in the second box down. So I think this is the key and clearly, the some of those control measures will be different for different parts of your organisation and different for different hazards. But this is why I say this is an opportunity. 
Now, the regulations provide for the development of prevention plans in relation to five specific risks, exposure to aggression or violence, bullying, exposure to traumatic con content or events, high job demands and sexual harassment. So I'd be very surprised if there aren't many in the sector who will not need to do all five because they're identified as hazards. And, and I say that with no, with no joy or reflection or criticism, but the idea behind this was that you would develop written um, implementation plans with the control measures and a record of what you've consulted. And then let's say you start to have a series of bullying complaints or you, you have them continually, you have an obligation to go back and review that prevention plan. And so um, I will sh give you this diagram. The, you, the slides will be available later. This came from the regulatory impact statement. Um, it's a bit hard to read, but the idea here is that you will have consultation throughout the whole process. At the start, you identify a hazard. You either implement the control measures or you do some more work to work out what they look like. Um, then if it's one of those five in the middle, you develop a prevention plan. Then you have to regularly review them. And then if you have it in the that final box on the right, if you have new information, or you have a hazard or the like, you have to go back and review them. So that means that the way that we approach, for example, bullying investigations uh, or health checks is not simply, you know, did Catherine behave badly and, and bully someone? It's also going to require a consideration of those hierarchy of controls and looking at it with a psychosocial hazard lens, which I do think will be an opportunity, but I think it will be a bit challenging at first and we'll get better at that. And as I said, this was the, um, the estimated cost for 200 plus employees for organisations over, um, of over 200. So the, the top there, it talks about undertaking a risk management plan. So two hours per employee in training and consultation um, and uh, 343,000 expenditure. Then the prevention plan is 174 and then the reporting system 187. Um, I, I say this as a guess, but my guess is that if the, the the view is that this cost is too high, we might see some elements of this introduced sooner rather than later. And perhaps, even though it was a staggered implementation anyway, we might see a difference over time. And so what, what the regulations look like in five years might be more extensive than what comes in originally if they decide not to go with any of this or to go with all of it. But we, we really have to wait and see. I thought I would just briefly talk to you then about one way to look at one of those hazards, one that I'm sure you're all very familiar with, um, but thinking about it with that psychosocial lens and using some of that material, and that's picking up on sexual harassment. So um, at the same time as we've been having this discussion, clearly there's been the, the work done by the Respect at Work uh, through this Respect at Work report and the very good work done by Kate Jenkins on understanding what the drivers of sexual harassment will be. And so that diagram there tells us that the most important driver of sexual harassment in an organisation is power imbalances, um, informed by things like workplace characteristics, so working away from home, use of alcohol, long hours. Um, <clears throat> whenever I do this, I automatically think of, of Commonwealth Parliament House with, with no judgment on any past or theoretical law cases or anything like that, but you can, you can see those factors. Um, but we also know that the risk increases in situations of significant gender inequality. So if you've got a big power imbalance and a lot of one gender and not of the other, or of others, I should say, um, that increases the risk. And likewise, intersectionality. So the, the meaning of that meaning, if you've got if you've got someone who's from a different culture from the predominant one, or a different sexuality from the, the predominant one, um, then the risk to that person increases a lot. So we know that we have these drivers. And so in an organisation, you might be able to identify where are the pockets where the risk of sexual harassment is higher, right? It's not about saying, you know, the people on that team or the men in that team are bad people. But if we have these factors, there is a higher risk. Um, what we now have across Australia, and we've had in Victoria anyway, but is um, a positive duty to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate unlawful sexual harassment or having people um, subject to a hostile workplace environment. And we've already had that in Victoria for a number of years. So what we now have as well at a national level um, are these guidance materials which have come from the Australian Human Rights Commission. They're there on the right. Um, <clears throat> and they mirror in part what we already had in Victoria. 
in relation to the Varioc standards and the idea that we have a plan that deals with organisational knowledge, culture, what the support is, how we assess risk, how we report, how we measure, which is not radically different from the idea that we have to look at all of these hazards, consult, get information, think about culture and, and work and job demands, do a risk assessment, put a plan in place, understand it, report it, measure on it and revise it. And so my suggestion would be, and, and I know many organisations already a long way down this path or have, have completed it, so it may not be relevant to all of you, but if you want to see how what might work in terms of your organisation and dealing with psychosocial hazards, maybe start with revising your approach to sexual harassment and applying that kind of hierarchy of control thinking, is there something you could learn from that process? And that might be quite valuable then in terms of thinking about some of the other hazards that might um, require um, attention over time. So if I'm to tell you my thinking, and I'll open up for questions soon, although if you've got any, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, my thinking then on what might change and what does it look like uh, again, it's a bit hard to know because we don't know what the regulations will look like, but my suggestions. The first would be that when we, as I said, when we look at complaints or investigations, I think it's opportune to review this as a risk issue, not just a conduct issue. So what are the factors that might contribute, <clears throat> excuse me, within a team um, and how can we apply a safety lens to this? So what might have been the work design factors? What were the, the situations that led to it? And particularly when you have endemic issues that occur from time to time. One of the both advantages and disadvantages of working in this area for a long time and having long-standing clients is that I'll sometimes be called in to deal with um, a range of bullying or harassment or the like complaints within a particular team for a client. And they'll send me the, the information and the complaints that are being made to by some employees and I'll look at them and I'll think this looks very familiar and I'll go back to a file from six years ago where exactly the same issues arose with almost entirely different personnel. So at that time there would have been a bit of a clean out, some people left and over time a range of other people left, whole new workforce, same behaviours. And what does that tell me? It tells me that it's not about changing the people. It's also about something endemic, that as new people in, get introduced into that team, um, <clears throat> this, there's a, luckily this is not common across the emergency management sector, but I've certainly seen it with a few of my clients and it's always in the same sorts of work environments, which I can't tell you, although I'm making it sound more interesting than it is. Um, but you know, the, the people change over time, but there's that inherited behaviour that continues. And as a result, that culture is endemic. Uh, and so it really hasn't been dealt with from a risk perspective. And so I think we need a different lens for dealing with complaints and investigations. Uh, as I've said, the consultation requirements, I think, to do well need to be a little more extensive than just health and safety reps, although they will be useful. But I think that's going to be important. I do think that there's a risk of, <clears throat> I've said an epidemic here, that might be a bit strong, but the idea of high job demand being used as a reason to explain things rather than necessarily um, just an issue and unfortunately almost all the guidance on high job demand um, it's often done from the perspective of scenarios involving the private sector but there are some of the interstate material that deals with in, in the public sector as well as examples but almost all the solutions for high job demand that are in the material talk about things like increasing staff numbers and reducing rosters Excuse me. So that's all very well if you can magic up an increase in your budget and hire a few more skilled workers, but I acknowledge it's not that easy. And so this is actually quite a difficult issue then um, to try and, um, and address just through that. But I do think it gives rise to the idea that you at least need to plan for staff shortages and excessive demand and show you've turned your mind to it. I think another thing that we need to think about here is the idea that the psychosocial hazards will differ over time. So if we think about an employee life cycle in the organisation, accepting that most employees don't stay with an organisation for life, but the risks you have as a new worker who may be less trained, less skilled, less power are quite different from the ones that you might have 
when you are promoted to a new manager and you've suddenly got to deal with difficult behaviour, or even when you are dealing with um, demands from outside work and you're starting to work part-time and you've got a sense of isolation perhaps because you are working from home or, again, a, a gross generalisation. But you can see how the, the hazards interact with life conditions and issues at outside work. And so thinking about the life cycle of an employee, I think is also a really valuable thing about trying to identify what those hazards might be at various stages. So what do I think this really means for organisations? Yeah. I'd say this, I think it's, it's timely to start the conversation and education about this. I'm still speaking to people who get psychosocial confused with psychological safety, which is fair enough, but to actually increase the fluency about all of this and to get people thinking more about how do we prevent these issues. And a great way to do it in your sector is to think about the difference between prevention, mitigation, response and recovery. We're pretty good at response, maybe not quite so good at recovery, but what are we doing about prevention preparedness or mitigation or however we want to describe the first of those stages, depending on your allegiance to any one particular model. But what are we doing from that risk perspective? Um, <clears throat> I think most organisations have increased the fluency around mental health, but this is an also an opportunity to do it from that risk perspective. So it's not about resilience training, which, you know, has its place, but uh, and it's not about EAP, it's about the other end. I do think that the, the biggest issue for many organisations is likely to be what this means for your line managers, because ultimately this is not a role for the PNC team or the risk team or the safety team. It actually has to be done by leaders at an individual level because they shape culture. They'll be involved in the job crafting issues. They'll be managing the workplace environment. Um, they are also then likely to be having additional resources on them. So they're likely to have high job demands if they have to do all of these things too. So how do we support those managers and skill them up? I think there's an opportunity to think about job crafting. Um, there are all sorts of industrial and other issues that, that come into play there. I'm not saying that's easy, but I think uh, it's an opportunity. And I do think there are benefits in consulting and continuing to consult on this, whether we call it formal consultation or not, because the organisations that I've seen that have done this um, have had the benefit of new ideas. Uh, and sometimes that's simply as, as simple as, you know what, in that team there, we're doing this really well. <laughs> We've got this system for, for dealing with high job demands and it's worked really well. Can we implement it elsewhere in the organisation? And so you'll have pockets of extremely good practice already or managers who've tried new things. How do we roll that out? And that might sound overwhelming, but I think for so many organisations, they saw during COVID and accepting that many of your workers were not in a lockdown situation, so this is not universal, but we saw the ability of organisations to pivot, managers to try new things, share them uh, and come up with new ways of working. And that, I think, has been really valuable and many of those things have been retained. But that wasn't about necessarily top down in all situations. It wasn't about a CEO or a, a board chair saying, you know, thou shalt do these things. It was individual managers coming up with ideas and then sharing them. So I think consultation and consultation at a range of levels, managers, leaders, workers, getting those ideas will also be valuable. So as I said, I think this is about an opportunity, not simply um, hopefully a range of obligations, but I do accept that if you're listening to this with limited resources and a whole bunch of other issues going on in your organisation, it might sound like yet another nice to have, but who's going to pay for it? Um, so I don't want to sound too idealistic in this space as well. But I might sh stop sharing there and I'm very open to any questions or comments that anyone might have. Thank you, Catherine. What a powerhouse. You can see why I asked Catherine to come and do this. We, <laughs> could we have got anyone better? I don't think so. Um, I think it was interesting. I was speaking to the people over in Canada the other day and um, I made this comment at the Mental Health in Focus last week and they're watching with interest what we're doing here in Victoria and the fact that the draft regs came out for comment and it's been really slow to for them to come to fruition and they said we're hoping this is because you know what you're doing in Victoria is going to be exemplary so you know we we can only hope 
Um, while I'm waiting for people to put some, hopefully, some questions in there, mind you, you've probably covered everything and blown them away, Catherine. Um, it was interesting last week at Mental Health in Focus, we had Sam Jenkin from WorkSafe speak, and, you know, he made the point that the there's going to be a 5% growth per annum on mental health claims until 2030. That's what they're working on. That's their projections. And we know that the sector's overrepresented in mental health claims, and he said that we're now talking about two-thirds of those related to unresolved personal conflict. So, you know, that's the latest, you know, straight from the horse's mouth. So, um, Rachel, you had your hand up. Thanks, Susan. Um, I was just going to say thanks, Catherine. Um, it's a lot of information and, and we've um, spoken just the other day as well. And, and it's really, I suppose, a great opportunity, although the regs are being delayed, that we have some really long lead in time to do some really sustainable change. And I think in being in emergency services organisations and often, often can be really reactive. So we're really looking forward to, I suppose, being able to make some big changes um, in this area. And I just wanted to highlight for those that, that may be interested um, about um, a, few, a few months ago, um, some of us have started a bit of a community of practice in this space for people that are leading the work within organisations because it's so new. We're all trying different things and different ways to engage with stakeholders and having an opportunity to to learn from each other. Um, and we're all at different levels of the journey. So, if, you know, if, if people are interested in that kind of community of practice piece um, around specifically this topic, um, you know, please also let me know. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks. And I guess that's a benefit in a way of the learning network too, isn't it? Because we know you know each other now, so it's it's wonderful. Sophie, hello. Thanks, Catherine. That was great. It's really nice to see it all in one spot, summarised and making sense. It was really helpful. Um, I was just making a comment about um the endemic challenges that you brought up, I think is really fascinating that you've had that longitudinal lens of seeing issues and then being able to go back and look at the fact that it's happened before, but with different people. I think that's a really important point and um, one to be explored further, I think. So, and you spoke about using a risk lens to, to um, address that. Could you explain that a little bit more? Yes, yeah, certainly. So, look, the, the areas that I have seen that in, I have to be, I've got to be careful about not identifying them, but have been in particular workplaces, particular type, particular sector, um, a public sector kind of employer or series of employers that have some common features in particular workplaces. And they are often uh, workers where they're, and again, this is a, there's a, a preponderance of, older men of a particular culture right? and again this is not a, about a particular gender I'm just saying that's the situation in, in one of them um, where they work in a relatively decentralized and somewhat remote environment uh, and where the younger workers coming in are inducted and kind of linked to working with one person who trains them up and so that in itself I think is interesting because it does it, there's a predominant kind of culture there of particular ages and a particular you know so white anglo-saxon male sort of thing again in this particular environment i'm giving all the disclaimers right um but uh and and those people have often worked in that environment since they've been 16 17 and by the time they're in their 40s they're in a position of power it's always been done that way we've always inducted the new people that way there's always a sense of initiation and everybody who comes in follows that model right and so if you think about that risk of a predominant culture, the difficulty of being a new person coming in. So sometimes we have issues about bullying um, and that can be to anyone. It can be someone who raises issues. Often people who are raising safety issues get bullied. Um, I had a really awful one where a young lesbian woman came into that environment and was subject to really appalling behaviour. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that's about the individuals, but if you apply that sexual harassment risk lens, you could have seen that risk happening before it started, right? And so I think um, it, it, you've got to be careful not to stigmatise and prejudge and say, oh, well, because of that scenario, we're going to have this issue. 
But I think uh, where you've had a series of complaints, um, where there is a predominant culture, where that culture is unlikely to change in the short term, uh, then how do we deal with that? And, and in, in many of these situations as well, across a range of different employers, the problem has been exacerbated because no manager wants to go in there, right? Because the manager who goes in and finally deals with issues and tries to stop it is then accused of bullying. So this is not an easy situation, which is why we see these, we informally refer to them as the boomerang cases, right? Like, oh, it's back again at X employer. It's going to be this than it is. Uh, I'm not saying they're easy, but I think um, to deal with them well is going to, and, and where it has, I've seen some organisations in this space have some success, is where they've really started to look at it from a risk perspective and try and pull apart the culture and do a lot more work in that and monitor it a lot more in an ongoing sense rather than simply waiting for a complaint to happen and then saying, oh, well, this time it was John Smith who behaved badly, so we're going to terminate his employment and hope that it changes, right? Um, That's yeah. great. Mm, thank you. And, and apologies for all of the um, all of the breaches of anti-discrimination law I just engaged in. So <laughs> obviously a generalisation. So. That's great. Okay, thank thanks. You. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Christina. Hi, thanks, Susan. I'm Christina Burke from Emergency Recovery Victoria. Um, Catherine, I just wanted to um, go back to the hierarchy of control for psychosocial risk um, and just to make sure that I've understand it correctly. So what you're saying is that... Um, you know, rather than starting with the lower order things that we all have, like EAP and the policies and the training that everyone has to do, that's kind of like, I guess, your hygiene level, like that's a given. Um, so the attention really should be at those, um, I guess, the higher order controls and um, uh, and yeah, tackling it at, at that level rather yeah. than trying to make sure that everyone's done their you know, their, their online sexual harassment training, um, That's right. really looking at um, the more practical things higher up. That's right. So the way it's drafted, that's exactly right. The way it's drafted in the in the regulation says an employer must eliminate so far as it's practicable. If it's not reasonably practicable to eliminate, they must reduce work so far as is reasonably practicable by altering the management of work, the plant systems of work, work design, workplace environment, or... B, using information, instruction or training. And then it goes on to say you can only use B if none of the control measures set out above in A are reasonably practicable. So I've kind of gone a bit further in my diagram, which we'll get after this picking up on what's been done interstate with the hierarchy. But yeah. the idea that information, training and instruction can only be relied on um, if the other things don't work is exactly So it's kind right. of flipping it, yeah. That's right. And I mean, yeah. you're right, they should be done anyway. You, you really can't be successful without taking that approach. Um, but I think, you know, for many organisations, uh, and I can't speak for those in the sector, but I do know there are many organisations who think they're pretty mature in this space because they run annual training <laughs> and then they have an information session and they think... Catherine, well, annual, quite annual training on what? On, on bullying, for example, or on... <laughs> or on sexual harassment or on good behaviour or, on, you know, they run an annual session for managers on how to deal with, with performance and conduct issues or, or whatever it is. They think that plus having an excellent policy and the fact that they may not have had a range of complaints means they're doing, you know, they've nailed it, right? And I'll have managers who'll say that or they'll have a really terrible issue and they'll say, this is out of the blue because our history tells us we've got everything ticked. Um, and, and yet, you know, sometimes that terrible complaint will be substantiated and it will lead to a whole range of other things coming up. So clearly um, there's an issue there. It just hasn't been acknowledged. So you're right, Christina, you need to do those hygiene pieces as well. But this is the opportunity to ask those other questions. Um, and I, I do think sharing your knowledge amongst yourselves about that will be really valuable because for some of that is intuitive, right? But some of it I think is quite new. So... Uh, again, at the risk of sounding like a complete safety nerd, I'm quite excited to see what happens in this space. I think the way we talk about this in five years and ten years will be very different from the way we talk about it now because we'll all learn and we'll see what works. And no doubt WorkSafe will share the success stories as well. Thank well Catherine, you. I'm, going to, I'm going to have to bring it to a close now. Um, thank you so much uh, for that. So what we will do is we will send out an Impact E News with links in it to the presentation and the slides. Um, you may have noticed that there are invitations for two other sessions coming up.
Uh, one is on using data for preventative strategies in October. And then in November, we've got um, accumulated trauma. So these are part of our sort of insight conversations that we want to get back up and running. And of course, October, the um, I mean, October, early October, the mental health showcase as well. So um, Nicole Middleton, thank you for suggesting this topic today. And uh, we're always responsive to doing these sorts of things. So if there's another topic that you're interested in, um, please let us know. And thank you for, for coming. And thank you once again, Catherine. Amazing. Yes, Thanks. lots of claps. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Enjoy the sunshine. <laughs>